It is therefore now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Deputy Premier. Today marks a momentous occasion. It is the 14th anniversary of Liberal scandal, waste and mismanagement. After 14 years of waste and political corruption, Ontario works harder, pays more and gets less. The Hydro One fire sale is just one example. Order. The Liberals make no mention of the sale until after the last election. When 80 per cent of the province opposes the fire sale of Hydro One, what do Liberals do? They sell it off to the benefit of their insider friends. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals just can't be trusted. So, Mr. Speaker, after 14 years and after the Hydro One fire sale, how can we ever trust this Premier? How can we ever trust these Question. Liberals again? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, and I'm very grateful for this question because we are celebrating 14 years. And let's talk about some of the progress that has been made. Because members of this House will remember that minimum wage has been frozen at $6.85 for all of the years that that government was in power. From $6.85, we're on our way to $15. People The graduation rate in, in, high, in high school, the five year graduation rate, was a, 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 a shocking 68 per cent. Only 68 per cent of kids graduated high school within five years. We have increased that, thanks to the great teachers in our schools, to 86.5 per cent. That is extraordinary progress over the 14 years in which we have You see it, please? You see it? Supplementary. A member from Leeds Grimble. Yes, Mr. Speaker, back to the Deputy Premier, because after 14 years of Liberal waste and political corruption, Ontario works harder, pays more, and gets less. Five OPP and stop the clock. I, uh, I sense a theme, and I'm going to get to the bottom of it immediately the outburst will stop. Please finish. Five OPP investigations into the Liberals is just— If you want to play that, I will. The, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, as soon as I sit down, you start. That's insulting. Five OPP investigations into the Liberals is just one example. That's right. Under the Liberals, we have had as many police investigations into this government as Tom Brady has Super Bowl rings. We've never seen anything like either before. But, Speaker, it took Tom 15 years to set his record. These Liberals, it only took them 14. When it comes to the scandalous behaviour and a lack of accountability, no one can match them, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, after 14 years, because of this unprecedented five Question. OPP probes, how can we trust this Premier or the Liberals ever again? Thank you. Yeah. Well, Deputy. Speaker, uh, let's think about where we were 14 years ago compared to where we are today, Speaker. Full day kindergarten for a four, three and four year old, four five year old Speaker across the province. Remember when. Goes both ways. The member from Lanark, come to order. And somebody else is really lucky. Carry on, please. Uh, speaker, when we think about our kids, kids in low-income families now have access to free dental care. They did not have that when you were in charge. And now people under age 25, Speaker, starting January 1st, will have free prescription drugs. That is great progress over the last, uh, uh, the last 14 years. Go on to your co 
college or university because they simply couldn't afford it. Now, Speaker, over 200,000 students have That's free right. tuition, and many, many more have access to uh, grants and loans. Think about the quality of our air. Think about Thank our air. We have clean. Thank you. Final supplement, the member from the Queen Carlton. The Deputy Premier, because after 14 years of Liberal waste and political corruption, Ontario works, hard, Ontario works harder, pays more, and gets less. The $1.2 billion cancelled gas plant scandal is just one example. While long-term care homes are struggling to upgrade beds like at the Osgoode Care Centre, or vulnerable seniors are being abused, as was the case in the last few months in the city of Ottawa, their government has been focused on managing Minister things like a $1.2 billion gas plant scandal that helped them win the 2011 election. Barack Obama spent less money becoming leader of the free world than the McGuinty Liberals did to win that election to save a few GTA seats. Now this scandal has ended up in a criminal court, according to the information. Okay. Please finish. Must have ripped off a band-aid too quickly for them, Mr. Speaker, over there. But according to the Information and Privacy Commissioner, they violated privacy laws. They obstructed inv investigations. We even found out on Friday that Ontario's Chief Information Officer, David Nickel, warned Question. former McGinty staffers not to delete emails. So, Mr. Speaker, after 14 years and because of the gas plant scandal, how can we trust Thank this you. Premier? How can we trust this government? Thank you. Uh, speaker, um, we have come through the worst recession since the Great Depression, and we have now got the lowest unemployment rate in 16 years in Ontario, Speaker, and we have balanced the budget. We've been strong, strong fiscal managers, Speaker, but think about social assistance. You froze social assistance rates. You slashed them, then you froze them, and we have now changed the rules so that people on social assistance are able to keep more of what they earn. They're able to keep support for their children, Speaker. We shut down all of the coal-fired plants, Speaker. Minister of Infrastructure, come to order. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. How are you doing? Good. Finish, please. Wrap up. Speaker, Ontario is a stronger, fairer, better place now than it was 14 years ago. Please. You see it, please. No question. The leader of the third party. Uh, no, sorry. Just keep doing that. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Deputy Premier, because after 14 long years of liberal waste and political corruption, Ontario works harder, pays more, and gets less. That is the Liberal legacy. Doubling the provincial debt in just 14 years is an example of that. Ontario is now the most indebted subnational jurisdiction in the world. We, more, we owe more than anyone else. While Liberal insiders doubled the debt, taxpayers footed the bill, and Liberal insiders got rich. Whether it's Samsung, Gandalf Group, or the 30 big renewable mega contracts, it was always Liberal insiders Minister that benefited from hard-working Ontario families pay more. Mr. Speaker, after 14 years and a provincial debt of over $300 billion, how can we ever trust Question. this Premier and the Liberal Party ever again? You know, Speaker, I'm grateful for these questions because it gives us a chance to actually review where we have been over the last 14 years. Let's just think about this, Speaker. We have created 760,000 new jobs in Ontario since we were elected.
resulted in 2003. My recollection is they wanted to start by f firing 100,000 people, Speaker. Our unemployment rate has dropped to 5.7 percent. It's been below the national average for two and a half years, Speaker. Our, uh, our economic growth is strong. We're leading all G7 nations when it comes to economic growth, Speaker. Private sector economists are forecasting that our growth, with growth will outpace the rest of Canada over the next two years, Speaker. We have made investments in infrastructure. We have made investments Answer. in schools, in roads, in hospitals, in bridges, Speaker. Those investments cost money. Speaker, we're investing them. It's creating jobs and it's improving this, uh, this society. Thank you. Supplementary. Member from Nipissing. Good morning, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier because after 14 years of Liberal waste and political corruption, Ontario works harder, pays more, and gets less. The assault on household pocketbooks through increased fees and taxes is just one example. When this government took office, Ontario was the economic engine of Canada. Sadly, today we're a have-not province. The Liberals added the Ontario health tax. We should have known it wouldn't end there. Families are now paying $2.4 billion a year in service fees. License and vehicle registration fees are up $503 million just in the last four years. Wow. Speaker, after 14 years and because of shameless taxes and fee increases, how can we trust the Premier Question. or the Liberals ever again? Well, Speaker, all I can say is I'm really glad that party is not in office, Speaker, because the investments that we have made have resulted in real change, Speaker. The lowest unemployment rate in 16 years, that's something to be proud of. We've reduced our debt-to-GDP ratio, Speaker, significantly, and we're on our way to do more, Speaker. We have a balanced budget, and that is allowing us to invest in the things that we care a lot about on this side of the House, Speaker. Free tuition for over 200,000 kids, students, child care, Speaker, child care spaces, more long-term care spaces, more supportive house, housing spaces. Speaker, the most vulnerable in this province are better off now under our government than they would have been under them, and they are better off because we've made that a priority, Speaker. They're the who froze social assistance rates. They're the ones that put onerous rules, rules to prevent people from getting it. Thank you. They're, they're Thank you. Final supplementary, the member from Rockton, Kent Middlesex. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the acting premier because after 14 years of liberal waste and political corruption, Ontario works harder, pays more, and gets less. Speaker, the loss of hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs is just one example. Yeah. Manufacturers have been dealt blow after blow by this government, soaring electricity costs, cap and trade, and now more red tape. Speaker, business owners and managers have been raising the alarm, but this Liberal government continues to insist that they know better. Well, Liberal denial doesn't help the communities and families who are hurt as these companies close shop. Heinz, Caterpillar, St. Thomas Ford Plant, Brockville's Procter & Gamble, Peterborough's General Electric, Bacardi, Westcast, too many to name here. Mr. Speaker, after 14 Question. years, and because this Liberal government's decisions continue to kill manufacturing jobs in Ontario, how can we trust this Premier and the Liberals ever again? Well, Speaker, my question is how can we trust them when all they do is distort the facts, Speaker? Withdraw. Withdraw. Very young. So let's look at the facts, Speaker. 760,000 more. Okay. The member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, come to order. Finish, please. Uh, speaker. A member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, second time. And I may go past the warning if I even attempt to sit down, and he says it again. Speaker, of course the opposition will pick up where the jobs have been lost, and that has been a serious issue. But I have yet to hear him talk about the 760,000 net 
new job. Let's be clear. 760,000 more jobs have been created than we have lost. Speaker, whenever a, a company chooses to close, we are there to help those employees. Stop the clock. The member from Leeds Grenville, the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, and the member from Huron Bruce come to order. Finish, please. There's a certain irony when he talks about the loss of Ford, uh, Ford uh, plant. They would have let the auto industry die. Thank you. Their advice, Speaker, was to let. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Speaker. Speaker, before I begin, I really just want to quickly congratulate my colleague Jagmeet Singh for the decisive win of the leadership of the uh, Federal New Democratic Party. Thank you. Thank you. He'll be touched that we gave him a standing ovation, I know. <laughs> Speaker, uh, my question is for the Thank Deputy you. Premier. There is a crisis in hospitals in Ontario. It is the new normal to hear horror stories of people waiting for days in emergency rooms and being treated on stretchers in hospital hallways with no privacy and no dignity. Last week, the Premier finally admitted that there's a problem, but her solution is to maybe, sometime in the future, reopen 150 beds that she closed in Toronto. 150 beds will not fix this crisis, not in Toronto and certainly not in the hundreds of communities across this province that are suffering under the weight of the Premier's cuts and freezes to hospitals. Just last Question. week, we learned the hospital in Thunder Bay, which has been in a near-constant state of gridlock for years, was forced to admit 400 patients in a hospital built for 375. What's the Liberal Thank government's you. plan to fix the mess that they've created in our hospitals? Speaker, uh you have well, to Deputy Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I remain incredulous, quite frankly, Mr. Mr. Speaker, that the leader of the third party continues to disparage the fact that there is a proposal that has come forward from, I believe, half a dozen hospitals in the GTA to help address the capacity challenge that they're facing particularly in advance of the coming winter, and we, as yet, don't know what the impact of flu will be. Uh, and they've come forward with a, with a very reasonable proposal, Mr. Speaker, for opening 150 beds at the old Finch site of the Humber River Hospital. We didn't close those beds, by the way, Mr. Speaker. We, transformed, we transferred them to the brand new brand $4 billion new, dollar Humber River Hospital, which is now providing the highest quality of care. But for the, for the leader of the third party, and this is her opportunity to be clear on this issue, does she or does she not support the proposal coming forward from the hospital system, supported, by the way, by the Ontario Health uh, Hospital Association, does she or does she not support their proposal for, under, for opening 150 beds yes, for transitional care, Mr. Speaker? Yeah. Speaker, I think it's incredulous that the Minister of Health can't fix the problems that he's made, and he has to wait for the hospitals to come together to beg for some kind of solution because of the crisis that they've created in our hospital systems. Look, Brampton Civic's acute care beds have been, by their own account, over capacity for more than two years. But it's not just Brampton Civic. Etobicoke General Hospital's acute care beds have also been over capacity every single day from January to May of this year. In January, capacity reached as high as 122 per cent, and this is when safe capacity speaker is supposed to be 85 per cent. When will this government admit that the problem is province-wide? and do something for the people forced to endure overcrowded hospitals in communities like Brampton and Etobicoke. Thank you. Minister well, Mr. Speaker, we are doing something. So we allocated $24 million in the spring budget precisely for to address this capacity challenge that is go. faced across the province in different hospitals, Mr. Speaker, a budget that that member, that leader of the third party, voted against. And she still hasn't given a reply as to whether she supports the Humber proposal or is against the Humber proposal. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we know that we face capacity issues, and that's precisely why, ironically, with the NDP specifically and emphatically asking us to address the capacity issues in our hospital, when we do just that, they're the first and, frankly, the only ones to stand up and oppose it. Yeah. Final supplementary. This is my third, right, Speaker? 
It's this, not my new question. I'm on my third. Thank you. Uh, speaker, the, uh, the remaining question goes back to the Deputy Premier. The um, bottom line is, notwithstanding the boasting that this uh, minister is doing, they shorted the hospital sector $300 million of what they asked for in the last budget. They didn't step up to the plate, even though they were begged to by the hospital association. Trillium Health Partners in Mississauga is also over capacity. The acute the care beds have, been, their beds there have been running as high as 109 per cent. Minister of the Environment, come to Hospitals have been forced to use unconventional beds, meaning hallway medicine. These figures represent real people in Mississauga, many of them who experience the worst days of their lives dealing with an accident or sickness that forces them to go to the hospital. When will the government heed the call of the Ontario Hospital Association and provide immediate investment in our hospitals? When will they actually do something to help people in Mississauga? Thank you. Minister of Health, Mr. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I was honoured to be at uh, Trillium. Uh, to, in Mississauga to announce, uh, beside the finance minister and the premier, a brand new hospital for that community, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, a hospital which will provide even a higher level of care to a greater number of individuals. And this is the situation throughout the, 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 the province, Mr. Speaker. We have 35 hospitals that are either new hospitals, either being built or in the planning stage, and we continue to make those investments. We've added more than 1,000 hospital beds in the last several years. We just talked about, which I can only imagine that the leader of the third party, by her silence, is against the Humber River proposal. She'll have to explain that to the hospitals in the communities that would benefit from that specialized care for seniors Answer. in a transitional capacity. But, Mr. Speaker, we're making those investments. We'll continue to make those investments, and we're seeing the impact Thank across you. the province. Question, the Speaker, my next part. question is also for the uh, Deputy Premier. On Friday in Sudbury, there were 22 people forced into unconventional bed space because the hospital was over capacity. Yep. That's 22 Ontarians forced to receive treatment in hallways or even broom closets. One person not getting the care that they deserve is too many. 22 people is nothing short of a crisis. And this happens every single day in Ontario. This is the new normal, new, new normal rather, for people who are sick. The last Conservative government fired 6,000 nurses, closed 28 hospitals, and slashed over 7,000 hospital beds. And the Liberals have cut our frozen hospital budgets for years now. And now that the Premier has finally admitted that there's a problem, her solution is 150 beds in Toronto. Can the Liberal government tell us how they expect 150 beds in Toronto to be enough. Thank you, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Chief Speaker, Government Whip. Mr. Speaker, the Humber River proposal, the Finch site, is just one of a number of proposals that we've received uh, from the hospital system, and, and proposals in a, an approach that is supported by the Ontario, the Ontario Hospital Association and reflects the $24 million this fiscal year that we've indicated we're investing specifically on capacity and ALC beds. But, Mr. Speaker, we continue to invest, and again, I have to. It's unfortunate that the third party is disparaging the PCs, despite their record on health care, because they're a close second, Mr. Speaker. They closed more than 9,000 beds, 24 per cent of all the acute beds in the province, 13 per cent of the mental health beds in this province, Mr. Speaker. They delisted home care, they reduced the number of drugs on the formulary, and they fired thousands of nurses, and they committed to finding another $600 million in cuts in health and education, in, in, Mr. Speaker, in the last Last election. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Sick Kids Hospital is also over capacity. This is a world-class hospital, something Ontarians can be proud of. But even this hospital, where staff care for some of the most serious, devastating illnesses and accidents that affect children, is not getting what it needs from the Premier. The Premier must know that this is a crisis. She must know how it affects the people of this province, the children of this problem, province. And still, the government's only solution is to reopen 150 beds that they closed in Toronto. Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, I want to, for a moment, you know, I'm the fir first to accept and even embrace constructive criticism. But there's a point in the dialogue, in the debate, Mr. Speaker, where I think we need to ask ourselves, are we, or one party, by repeatedly calling a crisis, calling an emergency, frightening people about the condition in our long-term care homes, 
frightening people about the conditions of our hospitals. And I had this discussion just last week with the president of the Ontario Hospital Association. There's a point at which I think we need to realize the, the impact of what we say among Ontarians. And we need to have that balanced approach where I'm the first to accept criticism where criticism is deserved, Mr. Speaker. But I think we need to do that in a measured way, which Answer. truly aims at making the system better and not instilling fear in Ontarians. Thank you. Final supplementary. You see it, please? You see it, please? Start the clock. Final supplement. Well, Speaker, the people of Ontario don't need the NDP to scare them about going to the hospitals. They're telling me they won't go to the hospitals because they're scared. And that's the reality that's happening in our hospitals. You know what? Ten years of freezes and cutbacks result in what we're seeing today. This government has been in office for 14 years, and this is what they've done to our hospital system? Shame on them. University Health Network hospitals are over capacity. Humber River Hospital, over capacity. Toronto East Michael Guerin Hospital, over capacity. Sick kids, over capacity. 150 beds will not fix the mess that this Liberal government has helped create. When will the government admit that the hospitals need more than what they have been allocated? Finally, invest in the good quality health care that Ontarians need and deserve and promise that moving forward they will at least be funded to cover inflation, to cover population growth and to cover the unique needs of our, of our communities. Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. Minister. Here's an example of the uh, increasing capacity and the infrastructure investment that we're doing in Hamilton alone, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. So Hamilton Health Sciences Jurevinsky Hospital and Cancer Centre, a $200 million project completed in 2012. St. Joseph's Healthcare West 5th Campus, a $500 Member from Beaches East York. Finish, please. Speaker, the Ron Joyce Children's Health Centre, a $70 million project completed that will facilitate 70,000 visits annually. And Hamilton General Hospital, $44 million to consolidate different services uh, into a new 100,000 square foot uh, facility, the $581 million for the West Fifth Campus on Hamilton Mountain, Mr. Speaker. These are just several examples Answer. in Hamilton alone of the investments that we've been making and are making and will continue to make, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the acting premier, because after 14 years of liberal waste, political corruption, Ontarians are working harder, paying more, and receiving less. Speaker, the cuts to Ontario's hospitals is just but one example. This government was responsible for Ontario's public hospitals suffering through four years of frozen budgets. This government continued to cut funding, pushing our hospitals to a breaking point. Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General warned this government the hospital beds were unnecessarily being occupied by patients waiting for long-term care or home care, causing delays. This government failed to act resulting in the dangerous levels of overcrowding faced by our hospitals today. Patients continue to wait on stretchers in the hallways. With flu season around the corner, Ontario hospitals are on the verge of a serious capacity crisis. Mr. Speaker, Question. after 14 years of hospital cuts and frozen budgets, how can we trust this Premier or these Liberals ever again? To the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have invested and increased the budget in our health care system every single year since taking off office, Mr. Speaker. That includes the most recent budget where we increased the hospital operating budgets by $500 million, which is on top of the previous year a $500 million new investment. Mr. Speaker, we are investing in new hospitals, in the operating of hospitals, ensuring, including in St. Thomas, Mr. Yeah, Speaker, itself and across the province. Uh, and it's regrettable that a party that closed, I think, 
27 hospitals, 28, is it 28 hospitals, 28. that closed almost 10,000 hospital beds, that made cuts across the system, Mr. Speaker, that that's a party that now is asking us Answer. to fix the mess that they created. We fixed that mess, and we're continuing to invest to make the best possible system in this province. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Mary West Glenbrook. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Deputy Premier, because after 14 years of Liberal waste and political corruption, Ontario works harder, pays more, and gets less. Stop it, Mike. <coughs> Originally, there wasn't uh, appeared to be a concern about certain terminology, and I'm now suggesting to the members of the opposition that the terminology is not acceptable to the House, and it won't be used. And I will ask you to stop using it. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, e-health is just one example. East York, second time. Please finish. Speaker, e-health is just one example of this political mismanagement and scandal. This government has been making and breaking delivery promises on e-health almost as long as they've been in power. Cronyism, overpaid consultants, outrageous expenses, lawsuits and settlements. The Liberals seem to have unlimited Governor creativity Whip, when time. it comes to finding ways to throw away our money on e-health. As the Toronto Sun summed up the Auditor General's damning report last November, eight billion and fourteen years Order. later, and we still do not have a working electronic Question. health record system. Mr. Speaker, after 14 years because of the e-health fiasco, how can we trust the Premier or the Liberals ever again? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, so I'm proud of the fact that over 80 percent of our family doctors are utilizing electronic medical records uh, in their offices. In fact, almost, if not virtually, every Ontarian, every Ontarian who is intersected with our health care system has an electronic health record, Mr. Speaker, and we find that that is making for better information and better decisions by frontline health care providers, as well as empowerment of patients themselves. So, Mr. Speaker, we have come a long way. We have remote clinical consultations, nearly three-quarters of a million that are happening with Telehealth Ontario, where face-to-face -face interactions digitally are happening between consumers of health care and providers of health care. We have the Ontario Laboratories Information System, where 92 per cent of all our hospital, community and public health lab data is available in that repository, and there are more than 100,000 users of that data. We have a digital health drug repository, Mr. Speaker, that tracks, among other things, the, well, the medications that are prescribed by health care providers. And it's, it, obviously, this is a moving target as we continue to evolve our digital health care system, but Thank I'm you. proud of the work that we've done today. Yeah. Your question, the member from Hamilton East, Story Peak. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Vice Premier. A couple of months ago, Sears Canada was given the court approval to begin liquidation sales. So far, 59 locations have been closed and more than 1,200 employees have been affected. The saga continues as we learn that Sears Canada is filing a petition to terminate their pension plans. And now Sears just announced on Saturday that they will be closing another 10 stores, including one in Hamilton. New Democrats have called on the Premier to actively work to protect the pensioners here in Ontario from being shut out from what they've earned over a lifetime. The lack of pension protection in this province is unacceptable. Sears pensioners need to know, will the Premier step up? Will she put pressure on the federal government to make changes to the bankruptcy and solvency and CC Question. AA process to, so that hardworking current and former employees are given priority to get paid the pensions they are owed? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sears remains subject to the uh, Pension Benefits Act, Mr. Speaker, and I know um, the Financial Services Commission of Ontario Fisco, which administers the PBA, including the Pension Benefits Guaranteed Fund, is continuing to monitor the situation. And, and filing for bankruptcy, Mr. Speaker, does not affect the assets in the pension plan. Monthly pensions will continue to be paid to the plan beneficiaries. In the event of the wind-up, a claim could be made on the Pensions Benefits Guaranteed 
Guaranteed Fund, Mr. Speaker. The PBGF is unique to Ontario and the only jurisdiction in Canada to offer such a fund. And right now, pensioners receive $1,000 through the fund. And Mr. Speaker, we are implementing changes to increase pensioner payments from $1,000 to $1,500, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, we, we, we care about the retirement security for the people of Ontario, and that's why we move forward with the changes to the funding framework for the defined benefit pensions plans, Mr. Supplementary. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'm surprised the energy minister is answering this, but anyways, the Ontario government should have been prepared for the end of Sears pension security. This has been expected for some time. And while today it might be Sears, tomorrow it will be another company, and there's been many in the past. This needs coordinated action from both levels of Liberal governments. Unfortunately, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Fund, which was just mentioned, will only guarantee pension shortfalls coverage up to 1500 I remember taking part in a system that still leaves many former Sears employees that have not and others without full benefits, and I remember 10 years ago when Mr. Arthur, appointed by your government, study the PGF fund and said the recommendation should be 2500 so it's no big improvement to 1500 you're still far short of what benefits are for people when are you going to do something about it thank you minister, minister of finance minister of finance mr speaker i appreciate the question and the concern the member has for those of our pensioners and retirees we've seen it time and time again when these things occur and if it wasn't for the, the backstop that the Ontario government, the only province, the only jurisdiction in North America which provides a pension guarantee. And those Sears employees, should they be affected, 90 per cent will be fully covered as a result of our pension guarantee, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that more needs to be done. That's why we've modernized our pension reforms to enable many of those pensioners and those that have existing programs to diversify to other holders, to protect their interests, and we'll do, continue to do more and we'll work alongside the member to try to make sure that everyone is protected in this province of Ontario. Thank, Thank you. you. The question, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Okay. Minister, food is what sustains us and gives us the energy to get up every morning, to work, to learn and play, and to go about our daily lives. Without a strong farm and food sector in, the sector in the province of Ontario, we would not be able to enjoy the bounty and diversity of foods that we love and share with our friends and families at this time of the year, particularly at Thanksgiving. As you know, Minister, our agricultural communities across this great province work extremely hard each and every day to provide us with more than 200 foods grown and harvested right here at home. And so this week is dedicated to the hard work as we begin Ontario Agriculture Week. Sure, Minister, sure. this week allows us to celebrate the, con con the contribution that our farm and food sector has given to our province for over 150 years. Can the minister please share with this House how our government is celebrating our province? Thank you, Minister of Agriculture, Food, Rural Affairs, responsible for small business. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the member from Barrie uh, oh, great for her pa passion about agriculture, of course. Uh, she's a very good singer of Good Things Grow in Ontario. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, it's this right is Agriculture now. Week in the province of Ontario, and we're taking time to recognize our farmers and, and farm communities that contribute to our communities and our economy. We're blessed in Ontario with nearly 50,000 family farms, uh, contributing in excess of $37 billion to Ontario's GDP. Just last Friday, in my riding of Peterborough, I was joined by the, my colleague, the member from Northumberland, Quinny West, here, here. to announce uh, $500,000 in funding from the Greenbelt Foundation for various farm and food processing across the province of Ontario. I must say one of the recipients was the very fine Miller Egg Farm in the Great Riding of Peterborough. Peterborough. And today, we're also welcoming the White Belts of Ontario, the Craft and Cider Association, and Ontario Craft Brewers to Ontario to celebrate their success. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that response and for the important message. It's great to hear that our government is investing in our farm and food sector to boost availability of local food. I'm also pleased to know that we'll be welcoming guests to Queen's Park who represent our farmers and food and beverage makers. 
Minister, Ontario Agriculture Week will come and go, but we need to acknowledge the hard work Ontario farmers do each and every day to ensure that we have food on our tables. I know my constituents in Barrie certainly enjoy foods grown and harvested locally. They purchase Foodland Ontario branded products at the supermarket and visit local farmer markets, including ones in Barrie and Innisfil. They want to know how the province is recognizing the long heritage of farming in the province of Ontario. Will the minister please tell this House how our government is honouring the province's agricultural sector and working to build up its future success? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Barrie for a supplementary. I want to acknowledge the Adefo family this morning uh, that hosted the Peterborough County Plowing Batch on Saturday. Yeah. And I can tell you the minister had a very straight furrow. So I'm also pleased uh, yeah. to announce today uh, that through our Ontario 150 Farms Commemorative Side Program, uh, we'll be looking uh, for those farms and farm families across the province of Ontario uh, that have had their farm for over 150 years, and we'll be uh, providing them with the appropriate signage. And I, I encourage all members from all sides of the House to make application. I also want to acknowledge the work that organizations like the Golden Horseshoe Food and Farming Alliance and of course, the Ontario Federation of Agriculture that represents over 30,000 family farms in the province of Ontario and to recognize their long history for farming in this great province. In fact, the OFA will be here at Queen's Park yes, tomorrow. Sir. And we're starting to launch or bring home the World Food Campaign to raise awareness about the wide variety of foods that are grown, harvested and made right here in Thank Ontario. You. We acknowledge, Mr. Speaker, Thank you. New question, the member from Dufferin Calvary. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier, because after 14 years of Liberal waste and political scandal, Ontario works harder, pays more, and gets less. Kicking 3,500 children off the wait list for life-changing IBI autism therapy just because they were five years old is one example. It took three months, a new— Stop the clock. The member from Kitchener-Conestoga, come to order. Chief Government Whip is warned. Finish, please. It took three months, a new minister, and the advocacy of thousands of families for the government to realize that autism doesn't end at five. Mr. Speaker, after 14 years and the government kicking children off autism therapy waitlist because of their age, how can we trust the Premier, the Liberals, ever again? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I appreciate the question from the member opposite. You know, we have um, we have opportunities uh, over the course of our political career to make decisions, and those decisions are always captured, enhanced, and they're captured out there. People report on them. You know, the member opposite talks about talks about our record on autism, which is, you know, I would say uh, when it comes to the allocation of resources, we are the best government in all of North America when it comes to focusing on autism. But here's, here's the irony in the question. The leader of the opposition sat in Ottawa for years. He had a decision to make about he had a decision to make uh, to support a national autism plan, and he voted against, against that. Oh. So, Mr. Speaker, when we talk about autism and what we're doing for children, and we compare both records, please don't make any confusion. Thank you. Wow. Supplementary member from Whitby, Oshawa. Here, here. Speaker, my question is for the deputy premier because after 14 years of liberal waste and political scandal, Ontario residents work harder pay more and get less. The Liberal government's arbitrary and cold-hearted approach to school closures is yet another example. Speaker, months ago, they had 600 schools on the chopping block. The Ontario Alliance Against School Closures says that in five years leading up to the release of the ministry's revised pupil accommodation Order. review guidelines, 277 schools were closed. Oh. Speaker, after 14 years, and school closures. How can Ontario residents trust the Premier or Liberals ever again? Thank you. 
Minister of Children and Youth Services. To the Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm pleased to rise in this House and, and speak to our government's record on schools and education in this province, Mr. Speaker, because you know the member opposite is asking the question, but is ignoring the 11 schools that were built or expanded significantly in his own riding. Oh, Mr. Not. Speaker, we continue to invest in Ontario's publicly funded education system, and you are seeing the results from full day kindergarten to graduation rates that are. Come to order. Both sides. Especially the questioner. Finish. Mr. Speaker, you're seeing the results from full-day kindergarten investments to graduation rates in this province. 86.5 percent of students are graduating versus the 68 percent that were graduating Shame. when that party was in power. Shame. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to invest in Ontario's publicly funded education system because it is the right investment for the people of this province. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Ontario's long-term care waitlist top 30,000 people right now. And just like our hospitals, the level of care in these homes is suffering under this Premier and her Liberal government. Last week in Ottawa, there was yet another incident in a home, this time involving verbal abuse of a senior in care. These stories keep coming up. It seems that every day I hear from family members who are telling me about the horrific conditions their loved ones face in long-term care. This is not a case of a few bad apples, as the Conservative member from Nepean and Carleton said. The issues in long-term care are systemic. They stretch to every corner of this province. Will the government finally acknowledge that long-term care is in a state of chaos and expand the scope of the wet law for inquiry to find and fix the serious problems in our long-term care system? Thank you, Deputy Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and absolutely the safety and well-being of every single resident in our long-term care homes is the top priority for me and for my ministry, and we're working hard to provide that high level of care that assures that safety and that security, Mr. Speaker. And I have been clear, and I'm going to be clear again, that non-compliance with the Long-Term Care Homes Act is absolutely unacceptable and will not be tolerated. And, Mr. Speaker, that's part of the reason why I introduced legislation just last week to strengthen the fines and the penalties and the measures available to my ministry and me as minister to ensure that compliance that we expect with the Act. Mr. Speaker, immediately if we receive a complaint or hear of a situation which is unacceptable, Answer. we conduct an immediate inspection and we act on the results of that inspection immediately, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, in response to the uh, incident in Ottawa last week, the Liberal member from Ottawa, West Nepean, said, quote, all Ontarians should be able to grow old with dignity in a safe, secure, and compassionate environment. And you know what? I agree with that, Speaker. I agree with that 100 percent. But what we have in Ontario does not come anywhere close to meeting that standard right now. Ask any family member of a loved one in care. They will tell you about the concept constant state of worry that they face every single day, wondering what's happening to their parent or grandparent or spouse. The Conservatives think the issue in long-term care is a few bad apples. The Liberals think the issue is Elizabeth Wettlaufer. When will the government finally admit that the chaos in long-term care is ongoing and affects the whole system and everyone in it? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, again, uh, I have the responsibility, as does my ministry, but ultimately it rests with me to ensure the safety and security of every resident in long-term care homes in this province. It's a responsibility that I take extremely seriously. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to the debate, and I anticipate and hope that the third party will support the increased compliance measures, including fines and penalties, the ability to suspend licenses and other powers so that we can assure that the highest quality of care is being provided and that safety and security exists. Mr. Speaker, but Mr. Speaker, I will work with all parties to ensure that we do the absolute utmost to provide that level of care. We owe it to those nearly 80,000 Ontarians who call home a long-term care home. That is their home. We have the responsibility, yes, and I take it very seriously, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. New question: The member from Manchester, Dundas, Flamborough, and uh, Westdale. 
Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Oh, he's a good guy. I know it's a priority of this government to help survivors of human trafficking heal and rebuild their lives and to prevent human trafficking from occurring in the first place. Last year, the government created Ontario's first ever strategy to begin to tackle this horrendous crime. This past week, I was pleased to learn about the new funding that was rolled out to support community partners across this province in their efforts to combat human trafficking and support survivors. The Native Women uh, Incorporated Hamilton and Wentworth received over $700,000 to support their emergency shelter, okay. transportation needs, and culturally respectful care. I was pleased to be able to announce that uh, in Hamilton, Speaker. Speaker, could the minister please tell us more about the funding question. announced at last week's announcement? Great question. Thank you, Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the member for his question for, and for his continued advocacy to support survivors of violence in the Hamilton area. I was pleased to announce last week that our government will be providing funding through both the Anti-Human Trafficking Community Supports Fund and the Indigenous-Led Indi Initiatives Fund of almost $19 million towards 45 projects aimed to provide wraparound services and supports to survivors of human trafficking. Mr. Speaker, this is the first time that funding like this has been available on this scale in Ontario or even anywhere in Canada. I'd like to thank everyone in the anti-human trafficking community who have assisted us with our strategy and with the need to create these funds. Our partners have told us how important it was for Ontario to move forward on our strategy. Last week's announcement Answer. is just the latest step. Thank you. Mr. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the minister for the great answer. I also want to thank all the service providers that work tirelessly to put an end to this crime and to ensure survivors have the supports that they need <clears throat> and that we can all play a part. Ending human trafficking is a very important step towards ensuring survivors can live safe, safely, free from threat, fear of exper experience or exploitation and violence. We know that service providers, speaker, law enforcement officers, and our government play a great role in making this happen. Human trafficking affects some of the most vulnerable people in our society, and that is why I am pleased that the government has launched its $72 million strategy to end human trafficking last year. And I'm sure that the additional funding announced last week Question. through the community supports will help. Could the minister please update the House on continued government efforts to support survivors and put an end to this ongoing crime. Thank you. Minister, minister of the Status of Women. The Minister of Status of Women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for this important question and for being a strong advocate for his community. Speaker, human trafficking is a brutal crime that affects the young and vulnerable in our communities. It is absolutely unacceptable, and it's something I want you to know that we are working hard to fight with our community partners. That's why I was so pleased to be along with my colleague as we announced that part of the funding announcement that gives, as we announced that uh, we are giving vital assistance to dozens of organizations on the ground who work tirelessly to protect and support survivors. Speaker, this funding gives support and resources to groups who are dealing with survivors of this heart-wrenching crime. But Speaker, I want you to know that our work to end human trafficking doesn't stop there. So here are some of the things we're doing. In addition to the Anti-Human Trafficking Act that allows for restraining orders and compensation, Answer. we're also creating a new Human Trafficking Lived Experience Roundtable. We've also enhanced funding to 47 service partners through the Victim Crisis Assistance Program Thank you. and expanded the victim witness. Thank you. Your question, the member from here, Andrew. Thank you very much. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Speaker, after 14 years of liberal waste and political scandal, Ontario works harder pays more and gets less. The Liberal Cap and Trade Scheme is just one example of how they have made life harder for the people of Ontario. The Premier rushed legislation, which enables the Liberals to continue doling out billions of our hard-earned dollars to Liberal friends. That's on top of the billions being sent to California, where Ontario businesses are forced to buy carbon credits. Speaker, it takes my breath away. Earlier today, I heard a member opposite arrogantly say, get over it. 
But, Mr. Speaker, after 14 years of scandals, wasteful spending and bad policy like their disastrous cap-and-trade scheme, how can we trust the Premier or her Liberals ever again? Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the uh, member opposite for that. I'll tell you what, what takes my breath away, Speaker. Uh, it's the amazing progress that uh, this government has made in the past 14 yeah, yeah. years to make, sure, to make sure, Speaker, that our children have fresh air to breathe. Yeah. Speaker, since this government closed the coal plants, there hasn't been a smog day in Ontario. There hasn't wow. been the orange haze hanging over the GTHA. That's real progress, Mr. Speaker. That's real progress, Mr. Speaker. And I can tell you the, the foundation of what we're doing in this province is to make the reduction of greenhouse gases Hello. fair and equitable for all businesses across the province. I'm still waiting to hear a plan from the other side, Mr. Okay. Speaker. Oh, supplementary. The member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. After 14 years of Liberal waste and political scandals, Ontarians work harder, pay more, and get less. Infrastructure to the ring of fire, or, or the lack thereof, is just one example. This government first promised to develop the ring of fire in 2010. And in the throne speech, they, they called it, quote, the most promising mining opportunity in Canada in a century, close quote. In 2014, they promised $1 billion to build a transportation infrastructure to the Ring of Fire. Since then, the Premier has made a lot Zero. of promises Zero. and some excuses, but still we've seen no shovels Nothing. in the ground. Zero. Northern Ontarians are running out of patience with this government. Mr. Speaker, after 14 years of waste and scandal and because of the broken promises Let's about go. developing the ring of fire, how can Northern Ontarians trust the Premier or the Liberals ever again? Never. Uh, to the, uh, the Minister, Minister of uh, Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Thank you very much for that question. Of course, the Ring of Fire does represent a historic opportunity to really affect economic change in this province. Member from Lanark, second time. Finish, please. Because of that historic opportunity to affect the economic underpinnings of this province, that's why this government committed a billion dollars to infrastructure development in the region. And we are going to build on that infrastructure development in the, in the region. Just recently, I can tell you that uh, we invested about $785,000, along with the federal government, to enable the Webekwe, Ibemamtong, Nishkantika, and Nabinamik First Nations to complete an all-season seasonal community service corridor study. That's the first step in unlocking the potential Answer. of the Ring of Fire commitment. And this is a, a commitment that the opposition parties should help us with instead of putting roadblocks in the way. We are going to open the Thank ring you. of fire. New question. The leader of the third party. Speaker, my question is for the Deputy Premier. A few weeks ago, I met uh, Denise Goranek, uh, her brother Daniel Real, used uh, shoelaces that he wasn't supposed to have to take his own life while admitted to St. Joseph's West Fifth site in Hamilton. Dan was the 11th person to die by suicide while admitted to the West, West Fifth site uh, in the last 18 months. Carol Patnode's daughter, Nicole, just 20 years old, died by suicide while released from the hospital on a day pass. Families of loved ones who need mental health care should be able to expect that their loved ones will be safe, Speaker, and receive excellent care that gives them every chance at recovery. When that doesn't happen and tragedies occur again and again, families deserve answers. That's why I, together with these families, have called for a coroner's inquest into the deaths of Daniel and Nicole and all of the others who tragically lost their lives. Will the government support this call, Speaker? Thank you, Deputy Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I do appreciate the question. Mr. Speaker, uh, no family should have to endure the pain of a loved one, a family member, a friend, or a colleague um, whose life ends in suicide. And, Mr. Speaker, it is 
You know, and let me, I think, on behalf of everyone in the Legislature as well, and I know the Leader of the Third Party uh, has done this, um, to express my deepest sympathies to the families of all 11 individuals who, over this period of 18 months, uh, regrettably and unfortunately lost their lives uh, in this way. Mr. Speaker, in response to the Third Party's call for a coroner's inquest, it's important to know that the coroner and the coroner alone uh, has and retains that right uh, to decide upon and begin an inquest. It's entirely at his discretion, Mr. Speaker. The, it's important, and I think we would all agree, that the and office sir. of the coroner operate at arm's length from the ministry and the government, and that's why we leave the discretion with the coroner himself. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I, I sincerely hope that a coroner's inquest will uh, come to pass and that uh, it will also focus on the resources that frontline staff need and the funding that our hospitals require. We know that mental health care workers in Hamilton, all health care workers in Hamilton and across the province are doing the best they can, but they're not being given the resources that they need. Hospitals have faced budget cuts, layoffs and bed closures in communities desperate for better care, including my city of Hamilton. After years of cuts, St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton is facing another $7 million in cuts, thanks to the current government, while Hamilton Health Sciences is facing another $20 million in cuts this year. Speaker. Will the government support the family's call for the coroner to consider these factors in any, con of any inquest that actually happens? Well, Mr. Speaker, unlike the leader of the third party, I'm not going to pre- judge or pre-assume what any potential investigation or inquest might find in terms of a relationship to these 11 unfortunate uh, suicides. Mr. Speaker, back in 2015, I personally asked the Ontario Hospital Association what more we could do to prevent suicides in our hospitals, and I asked the OHA if it would create a task force of experts and individuals with lived experience to develop re recommendations for preventing deaths by suicide by patients and clients under hospital care. And we recently received the report of recommendations from the Suicide Prevention Task Force. In fact, these recommendations have now only recently in past weeks been shared with all OHA, all hospital members, to all hospitals across the province. And I believe that this will be yes, one step, but one important step, so we can all come together to make sure that we're doing what is required to prevent these tragedies from taking place in the future. Thank you. New question, the member from Etobicoke North. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Seniors Affairs. Seniors Affairs are particularly important in my own riding of Etobicoke North, as we have a very healthy, vibrant, and growing contingent of seniors. And as you may know, Speaker, uh, yesterday, October 1st, marked National Seniors Day in Canada. It was also the United Nations International Day of Older Persons. The Ontario Seniors Community, Speaker, is over 2 million strong and will more than double in the next 25 years. And for the first time in Ontario, in Ontario, there are more seniors over the age of 65 than folks under the age of 15. And as you will know, Speaker, seniors have played an important role in building up the communities of this province and have achieved so much and contributed so greatly to a diverse and prosperous Ontario. Speaker, my question is this. Will the Minister of Seniors Affairs please inform the House about what the government is doing to support question. seniors and communities across the province of Ontario? Thank you, Minister of Seniors Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and merci beaucoup pour la question. Thank you for the question. Speaker, uh, I also want to join uh, in uh, celebrating and congratulating on the occasion of National Seniors Day and International Seniors Day, which was yesterday. In fact, uh, I was joined by the member from uh, Trinity Spadina yesterday as we celebrated National Seniors Day and International Seniors Day at the waterfront. Our government is fully committed to helping seniors age well, to be safe and live active, independent lives in comfort and dignity. That is why we continue to invest in numerous programs to better support our seniors, and I look forward to speaking more about it in the supplementary. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, uh, Minister, for your uh, stewardship of this file. The Seniors Community Grant Program is one that is particularly popular among my own community groups in Etobicoke North. 
These groups are integral parts of communities and work to provide seniors with space to share and learn and prosper and opportunities to enjoy new and exciting experiences. When the Seniors Community Grant was developed in 2014, it opened doors for many of these groups to expand their programs and offer unique experiences to Ontario seniors across the province. And I know the minister was recently in Scarborough to make an, a, a related announcement, and would you please inform this House about the next round of Seniors Community Grants? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and I again want to thank the member from Etobicoke North for the very important question. As he mentioned, uh, the Seniors Community, Community Grant Program is an integral part uh, of the services we provide our seniors, and it has so far, Mr. Speaker, supported more than 1,300 initiatives, benefiting almost 440,000 seniors across the province. And last Monday, I joined with Habitat for Humanity in Scarborough to announce the opening of applications for the next round of grant funding. In addition to the grants which have been awarded in the past, we have created a new dedicated ski, uh, stream this year for larger scale initiatives. Answer. Under this new grant stream, organizations could be eligible to receive up to 100,000 for projects that are regional or provincial in scope. Applications are now open until the end of November. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members of provincial parliament are invited to join me. We're going to, with our courageous Iraqi parliamentarians, uh, we're going to have our photo taken on the grand staircase in just a few minutes after question period, and everybody is welcome to join us. Thank you. Point of order, the member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd just like to welcome my guests, Ron and Shirley Levine, from the Great Riding of Waterloo Region. Thank you. Deputy Premier, point of order. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And on behalf of the Liberal Caucus, we wish to off offer our congratulations to the member from uh, uh, Gormley, Gormley, Gormalton, Jamie Singh, on his uh, on his leadership win. Thank you. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.